I'd like to thank Angelina for reading the scripture this morning. I love to see our young people up front Amen. taking part. And I don't know where she got it from, but Mrs. Simmons, I just love that story. I hope not just the children can remember it, but I, I hope all of us remember it. Our need to let go of the world, hang on to Jesus. And Janice, your song this morning, what a blessing it was, is who am I? We need that. We need to remember that we are nothing and that his love for us is everything. So I thank everyone that took part this morning. Good news for you is this is the last you're going to have to put up with me for a while. Our pastor's going to be back next week. He's actually been back. If you'd have been at the business meeting, you would have seen him, or at prayer meeting, he took care of that. But his brother-in-law is getting baptized today, and so they ran off to be there for the baptism. Amen. Guys, how'd you get ahead of me here? Would you like to start that from the beginning? We're, we're way into things here. Should just be the sermon title up there at this time. Two weeks ago today, the 60th General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, uh, which took place in the Alamo Dome of San Antonio, Texas, ended on this day. And that day, from the pulpit, I said that we needed to pray for unity. I was told afterwards that some wondered what I was talking about then. So I would like to take a couple minutes this morning to give you a brief explanation because I believe it really ties in to the message this morning. Now I am sure that there were many issues that were addressed and solved at that conference. However, there was one issue that took center stage, and that was of women's ordination. We had two sides, and I'm sure that both sides were very well-meaning. On one side, you had those that say, in the day and age that we're living in, there is a great need to ordain women in the pastor, uh, position of a pastor. On the other side were a group that brought forth much scripture that led them to believe that that should not take place, that men are the only ones that should be pastors. Now, I am not going to share with you my opinion on this, because I believe that opinions are like noses. Everybody's got one. <laughs> the reason I bring this subject up, though, is because there have been denominations in the Christian faith that have split over this issue. And just because the, the vote was 900 and some for and 1,300 and some against that they thought it was settled, it's not settled. We can still have waves coming out from that causing problems in the future. And so that's why we need to pray for unity. Would you pray with me at this time? Dear Heavenly Father, the things going on in the world today reveal to us a fight between Satan and Jesus. We are in the throes of the, the last great controversy. We are near the end of time. And the message that you have laid on my heart this morning, I believe, is very important for these last days. And so I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to be poured out in the sanctuary. Guide my every thought, word, and action, and open the ears of the hearers so that they may see what in this message pertains to them. This I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Now, 
most of you know that my wife has been laid up for the past two months with a broken bone in her ankle and she is doing much better she's in physical therapy but that gave her much time to read and watch television and one of our favorite networks is the amazing facts network and she listened to that quite a bit but she she made the observation that Doug Batchelor was often telling them the same thing over and over. He was doing a lot of focusing on this women's ordination. Now Doug Batchelor has told us for years that he studied himself into this church. That there is no other church that follows scripture like the Seventh-day Adventist church. The thing that caused her concern, however, was that he said if women's ordination passed, he was going to have to withdraw from the church. Now I didn't personally hear him say that, but I believe my wife would report correctly on a situation like that. My question is, where would he go? And in your meditation this morning, we'll look to it later, is a statement by Mrs. White, because I don't believe there is anywhere else to go. Because we are not a denomination, we are a movement. We are supposed to be taking the loud cry to the world and finishing this work so we can go home. Now, we're in line. John 6.63 says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. Now, the, the word there for spirit, even though it's not capitalized, that's the Greek word pneuma, and it's usually interpreted as for the Holy Spirit. And so... The Spirit is what guides us here. The word quickeneth in the Greek is, and forgive me, I don't profess to be a Greek scholar by any stretch of the imagination, but the word is dozapaeo, and it means to vitalize or revitalize. The King James says it's to make alive, give life, or quicken. And so here we see that this Holy Spirit is what gives us life. So we, do we have need for the Holy Spirit? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Verse 64 says, But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. Notice here in verse 64 that he knew those who were not being led by the Holy Spirit. All the way through, we know that he knew that Judas was not being led by the, the correct spirit, but he allowed him to stay with him. But did Judas make the right decision at the right time? And we know he didn't. So we know that he lost his life. He went out and hanged himself. And we believe that he lost something even more precious than that. And that was his salvation. Here we see the danger of separation from the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Verse 65, excuse me. And he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given to him of my Father. Verse 66, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Now I hope, I'm glad to see that the vote didn't go that way only because I'd hate to see someone who is so influential as Doug Batchelor attempt to pull out of the church. It just is not right. But Jesus said, said to the twelve, Will you... I lost my place. Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And you have the words of eternal life. We've got to follow 
his word and his word only. It is the only source of truth. This is not what many people are thinking about at this time. Matthew 12, verse 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided itself shall not stand. This is not a time to be separating from God's church. The pen of inspiration gives us counsel in, in second uh, volume of Selected Messages, P, page 380, uh, ver uh, paragraph one, excuse me. We are to be ready and waiting for the orders of God. Nations will be stirred to their very center. Support will be withdrawn from those who proclaim God's only standard of righteousness. The only sure tr test of character and all who will not bow to the decree of the national councils and obey the national laws to exalt the Sabbath instituted by man of sin to disregard of God's holy day will feel not the oppressive power of popery alone but the Protestant world the image of the beast. Now notice in there that it said that about national councils and national laws. There was not a United Nations when she wrote this. There is now. And we know this fall, the Pope is coming over and he is going to address the United Nations. And he is going to come meet with our president. And not just our president, but the president's wife. They're both meeting with him. And we know from our reading of the great controversy that in the last days we're going to see a Sunday law. There's already pushing it in Europe and it's going to be seen here. Satan will work his miracles to deceive. This is your meditation, by the way. He will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out, the chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths, we must be divested of our self-righteousness and arrayed in the righteousness of Christ. Amen. Thank you for the amen on that. In this, these last days, we need unity. And my message today is on a subject that can destroy our unity, and I'm talking about an unforgiving spirit. Matthew 18, verse 21 says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Angelina told us the answer to that. Jesus said to him, I do not say up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven times. Now, how often have you been offended by someone and failed to forgive them? Have you ever forgiven anyone 490 times? Or have you harbored some of that anger and hostility? Matthew 18, 23 says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king who has settled his accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. How much is 10,000 talents? Let's try to break this down. And we're going to do it in 
an inexpensive way because we don't know whether he owed him 10,000 talents of gold or 10,000 talents of silver. So we're going to go with silver. But, and there are many people that, that uh, figure a talent in different ways. I've heard it anywhere from 50 pounds to 70 pounds, the most common being 57 pounds. But I found a little online calculator that a guy had, had uh, put up there, and using his calculator, he says that 10,000 talents would equal 753,980 Point nine three six six seven two two eight pounds. I don't know how he carried it out to that many decimal places, but that's what he said. And for ease of figuring, we're just going to round that up to seven hundred and fifty-four thousand pounds. Okay. Now, how many ounces is that? That comes out to twelve million sixty-four thousand ounces. That's a lot of ounces, isn't it? Last week on the exchanges, silver traded for about $14.70 an ounce. That means that that servant owed the king an equivalent of at least $177,340,800 in today's money. Now, I'd like to see the hand of any of you out there that has a rich uncle that could help him pay off that debt. I didn't think I'd see any hands on that, and I don't. But you know, this whole story, this parable, is allusion to the forgiveness that God has for us. And he has given us more forgiveness than that that, than what this 777 million equates to. Because in Romans 6.23, we're told what? That the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That forgiveness gives us the gift of life, brothers and sisters. 177 million is nothing when it comes to the gift of life. John D. Rockefeller is quoted as saying he would give his whole wealth if he could just have his health back. And that's what God is willing to do for us. He is willing to give us our health back. So this, this king forgave this servant for this... Uh, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Because it's... Next thing. Yeah, Matthew 18, 25. I'm sorry. But he was not able to pay, as we wouldn't be able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, that all he had and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. I don't know where he thought he was going to get it. But in verse 27, it says, Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. It released him and forgave him of that debt. That debt is something, as I said earlier, we cannot repay. And so we need to have that same forgiveness. But now, after being forgiven that debt, the servant goes out. And he finds another servant that owes him just a mere 100 pence. Nothing like all those talents that this king forgave him of. And in this situation, let's see how he handles this forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse 29. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you all. Isn't that the same thing that this first servant said to the king? Absolutely, the same thing. Verse 30, And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved, and they came and told their master all that had been done. Now here's where the story, I believe, gets very interesting. 
Matthew 18, verse 29. I'm, I'm sorry, I already read it. Verse 32. Then his master, after he had called him, said unto him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Verse 35. For so my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. I hope it's as clear to you as it is to me that this king was willing to forgive all of our sins. The servant refused to forgive as we often fail to forgive others. And we see in this parable the king rescinds his offer of debt forgiveness. To me that indicates our, our forgiving will, can be lost also. We can lose our salvation if we are not forgiving. Now this is a parable. Is it possible that I'm not interpreting this correctly? Do we have any other, other scripture to go along with it? Matthew 6, 14 says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your, excuse me, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, if you have anything against any of your brothers, that your Father will also, which also is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forget neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Is forgiveness important? Did I interpret the parable wrongly? No. Forgiveness is of paramount importance. Now, allow me to digress a little bit at this point because we are in the time of the world's history where we need the Holy Spirit. Amen. I take part in two Bible study groups and in both of those groups we're praying for the outpouring of the latter day rain. And I hope you are too. But for the sake of of some of our younger members that are not familiar with this terminology or new members to our flock, let me go back and take a look at some things that are necessary. The first thing we receive is justification. When we come to God, when we realize about Jesus, when we want Him to be our Savior and we pray for His forgiveness and repentance on our behalf and turn from our sins, this is what we receive. We get justified. And this happens not only the first time you do it, but any time that you get down on your knees and ask Him to forgive you. He justifies you. But the second thing we need is sanctification. And sanctification, many people refer to as the work of a lifetime. That's when we allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. And in that guidance, we allow Him to overcome those things in our lives. And I hope you see exactly what He has helped you overcome in your life. Because as I was telling Junior out front this morning, it's looking at those things that he's helped me overcome that gives me faith that he will help me overcome those things that I still need the power to overcome. That's sanctification. And the last thing we have is glorification. That's what every Christian should be looking forward to.
because glorification is when those 144,000 are standing there when Jesus comes and the graves open up and all the dead out of the graves rise. They are changed in a twinkling of an eye. That corruption puts on incorruption. That mort mortal puts on immortality. That's the glorification. And then 144,000 join them. That's going to be an exciting time. And the thing about it is it's near in the future. We're near that point. We just have a little bit to go before we get there. But we have to finish the work. That's why unity is important. That's why being filled with the Holy Spirit is important. Now, while on this earth, Jesus lived in an agrarian society. That's, that's one that bases its, its whole economy on agriculture. And that's why he uses parables like the one we looked at last week about the sower. And we see it in the writings of many, like this from James. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Latter, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 8. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Now the rain that is being spoken of here is an allusion to the Holy Spirit. The early rain brought about germination and early growth just as the Holy Spirit brought about our conversion and that justification. The latter rain brings about the ripening of the harvest and that's what we need today. Mark 4, 28 says the earth brings forth fruit of herself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Just as the plant is perfect in every stage of its development, God sees us the same way. Because when he looks at us, he sees his son. And I praise his name for that. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest is come. We know he's coming. When he comes, he harvests. Before that harvest, the full corn has to be in the ear. We have to be matured as Christians. And the only way that can happen is by the latter day rain because that's the one that finishes the growth in the fruit. We need the Holy Spirit, and we desperately need the power of God to change us that the desire of Christ may be filled in us. Now, what is the desire of Christ? In Philippians 2.5, we see, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Now, who can hold up their hand and say that the mind of Christ is in them now? I know I can't. But that's what we need. And in order to get there, we need that Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit give us? He gives us the fruit of the Spirit, doesn't he? Galatians 5 verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now, can that fruit be obtained while we are harboring an unforgiving spirit? I don't believe so, and I believe I'm going to demonstrate to you some of the reasons for that this morning. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, and by the way, this version that I have up here isn't from the King James. I put this one up here. This comes from the, the Holloman Christian Standard. It happens to be one of my, fa my wife's favorites, and it's a little easier to read, but it brings across the same points. 
We're looking at, we know that 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. We're just looking at verses 4 through 7 here because we see the characteristics in that love chapter. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, does not boast, is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, does not keep a record of wrongs, finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, if you are harboring an unforgiving spirit, are you un enduring all things? Are you free from envy? Were you not provoked that started this unforgiving spirit? I believe that if we look at these, these fruits of the spirit, we see that if we have an unforgiving spirit, love has to go out the window. Also, our next one is just about as important, joy. Now, many of you know that Larry Moore baptized me years ago, and one of the things Larry Moore said in church was, I want to see a church full of glad Ventists, not sad Ventists. <laughs> we need joy. But let me ask you the question. Have you seen or heard anyone out there that has an unforgiving spirit that still has joy in their heart? I can remember back before I was ever a, a Christian, and I, I hate to talk about this, but I was in the military and we were working 18 hours a day, seven days a week. And we didn't have much time to ourselves. But I can remember one night we decided that we were still going to go out to a, a local bar and have some drinks. And I was at the end of the bar standing next to a wall. And we had a sergeant in our squadron that I despised. He was worthless. And he just got on everyone's nerves, but he, he could really rattle my cage. We're out there trying to be joyous, have some fun, and he walked in the door. And my joy went out the window. I'm ashamed to say I punched the wall. And I punched it a little too hard and I went through the wall. It cost me about $100 to repay it. And I'm happy to say that this day and age, I hold no animosity toward him anymore. And I don't believe I hold any animosity toward anyone that I've ever known. The Lord's gotten me past that. But it takes very little to cause us to have that unforgiving spirit. But with an unforgiving spirit, joy has to go out the window too. Now what about peace? How in the world can you have peace in your heart if you have an unforgiving spirit? You may feel like you've attained it, but I'll guarantee you Satan is going to bring those thoughts to you every chance he can, and you're going to lose peace. So with your permission, I'm going to take peace off of our list too. Long-suffering, also known as patience. That says that we don't have to have our own way. Are we trusting in God when we are unforgiving? Let's look at what Paul says. Romans 12, verse 19. Friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for his path, for it is written, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. Now he says we're supposed to leave it up to him. If we're not leaving it up to him, are we trusting in him? Are we really 
being patient? I don't think so. So long suffering has to go from our list too. Now gentleness. Gentleness is defined as having or showing a kind and quiet nature. Not harsh or violent. Not hard or forceful. Not strong or harsh in effect or quality. An unforgiving spirit overpowers these acts of, aspects of character and therefore negates gentleness. Goodness. We're told that goodness is the quality of being good. But what is that? Now, in Matthew 19, verse 17, Jesus was, was talked to and he said, There is none good but one, that is God. Therefore, I equate goodness with godliness. And God is love, is he not? We already saw in the love chapter that love does not keep a record of wrongs. So if we have an unforgiving spirit, we are keeping a record of wrongs. Can goodness exist with an unforgiving spirit? It goes too. Meekness. Now what is meekness? A lot of people think that meekness is just, you know, just being so timid. But that's not really what it means, is it? Meekness is defined as enduring injury with patience and without resentment. Jesus was able to do that, wasn't he? Just think what he went through for our sins. And yet we're told he was the meekest man on earth. He endured that injury with patience and without resentment. So is not harboring an unforgiving spirit maintaining your resentment or anger? Absolutely. Meekness has to go too. We're getting pretty short, aren't we? We're down to temperance. I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot of times. I had a, a member in my church in, in California. Her husband had been a preacher. And he was upset about things and he turned to drink. There are many people that get drunk when they're angry with someone. Now I know none of us here would do that, but then might some of us here, if they're angry about something, binge on comfort foods? That can get rid of temperance real quick, can't it? So I'm sorry, temperance has to go too. What's that leave us with? Blank space. We can't have a blank space. You know what, what is there when it's a blank space? Self. We get filled with self. Is that what Jesus wants of us? No. We are told that we need to die to self daily. So if we have an unforgiving spirit, we've already seen the fruits of the spirit are out the window. And Jesus told us that we need to have a forgiving spirit or God will not forgive us. And we need that Holy Spirit in these last days. So forgiveness is what has to go. And I hope that you do not harbor an unforgiving spirit. Now the thing about it is it takes very little to get that unforgiving spirit. I worked with the Adventist singles up in Arkansas for a few years and we'd have singles emphasis Sabbaths at different places and we had one at my home 
church in Bonnerdale, Arkansas, and the people would arrive from at different times because they're driving from all over the state. And there was one of the, our, our members of our organization that came in just before church, and she sat down in a pew. And it can be any pew. It doesn't matter. She was comfortable waiting for church to start. And an elderly lady got out of Sabbath school and walked up there and looked down at her in that pew, and she said, you're sitting in my pew. <laughs> the young lady looked up at her and said, oh, well, that's nice. No, you don't understand. That's my spot. You're sitting in my pew. The young lady said, I'm sorry. She got up and left. The elderly woman took her place. And what do you think happened to the young lady? She headed for the door. Now I found out about it right after the church service was ready to begin and I tried to run out but her car was already gone and out of the parking lot. I talked to her later about it and said, you know, we are a hospital for sinners, not a rest home for saints. And people say things. Don't let that upset you. But it had. And as far as I know, she never went back to church after that. We never saw her in another meeting. She harbored that unforgiving spirit over something that minor. Now you know why I said we need to pray for unity about such a major issue in our world church today. Because we know there are going to be people leaving our church in these last days <coughs> over little things because Satan's disrupting it. And he wants to destroy our unity. But we also know that there are out the people out there that hear the truth and want to come in. And we want to be here to bring them in, to encourage them, and to bring about joy. And so, brothers and sisters, don't lay yourself in there. My prayer is that each of us makes room for that Holy Spirit in us. And that Holy Spirit, those fruits of the Spirit taking residence in our hearts will make no room for these things that Satan wants to use to draw us away. Thank you for your time.